Hi, good evening. This is Lisbeth Show Top One. Once again, I am uh, promoting the Trinity Cares Health Concierge where we just have to keep on talking to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit, to help us uh, deal with our issues, challenges, you know. Uh, they really want us to be happy. But of course, uh, we have to get rid of our negativity and uh, today I opened my Bible at Ezekiel 45 I know Ezekiel was a prophet but um, I must have read it uh, before but in detail I'm not really uh, that well versed you know, I just open my Bible and try to see what uh, what will strike me. You know, like uh, that will that will get my attention. But today I um, try to know who is Ezekiel and um, why is he. Um, had a book and so when I was reading it this is the one that really um, strikes me on verse 9 so let's listen to to the uh, let's listen to it about him you know like a uh, bird's eye view, overview of Ezekiel and how does the book will touch you, will touch me and uh, will give us uh, points to ponder that probably would help us be transformed from an, our old ways and so um let me first probably do the overview to you know i like like when i was studying medicine eh, when it's a big chapter you know i scan through it first you know try to have an idea what's uh, what are the points that we'll uh, try to get you know so i scan first the chapter then i read it again you know slowly and try to uh, take notes and you know underline <laughs> that's why my book you know especially the big one it's like a coloring book <laughs> so at first i highlight it with yellow uh, yellow then i then later on i highlight with the um, probably pink or green you know something like that so the more color it means i've read it twice i've read it once i've read it uh, three times so it gives me an idea if i have to read it again okay let's get an idea who ezekiel was uh and what the uh, has transpired during his his um, lifetime, especially significant to Christianity, you know. So let's see. Priest who had been living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack on the city, and they spared the city, but they took a first wave of Israelite prisoners and hauled them off into exile. And Ezekiel was among them. So the book begins five years after all that, and Ezekiel is sitting on the bank of an irrigation canal near his Israelite refugee camp, and it's his 30th birthday, no less, the year that he would have been installed as a priest in Jerusalem. 
And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel has this vision. He sees a storm cloud approaching. And then inside the cloud are four strange creatures that have wings outstretched and touching each other. And these creatures each had four faces. And then he saw four wheels, one by each creature. And then he saw that the wings of the creatures were supporting this dazzling platform. And then on that platform is a throne. And then sitting on that throne is this human-like creature glowing and shrouded in fire. And then all of a sudden Ezekiel realizes what he's seeing. He calls it the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It's God riding his royal throne chariot. Now the word glory, in Hebrew it's kavod, it means heavy or significant. The biblical authors use this word to describe the physical appearance and manifestation of God's significance when he shows up in person. These images in the vision, they're very similar to what happened when God appeared on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. And it's also very similar to the depictions of God's presence over the Ark of the Covenant. And that's actually the most shocking thing about Ezekiel's vision. What is God's glory doing in Babylon? It's supposed to be above the Ark of the Covenant in the temple in Jerusalem. And so the first section of the book opens to explore that question as Ezekiel begins to accuse Israel of rebellion. So God first speaks to Ezekiel from the throne chariot and he commissions him as a prophet. Ezekiel is to accuse Israel of breaking their covenant agreement with God in a couple ways. Israel has given their allegiance to other gods and has been worshiping idols, and this has all led to rampant social injustice and violence. And so as a result, God appoints Ezekiel to warn the people. The first Babylonian attack that took Ezekiel into exile is going to be matched by another, and Jerusalem, its temple, all face imminent destruction. So Ezekiel uses words and more to get his message across. He also performs sign acts. These were a form of street theater. Ezekiel would go out in public and start behaving in these really bizarre ways that were like parables of his prophetic message. So he was supposed to build a tiny model of Jerusalem and then stage an attack on it. Or he was to shave off all of his hair and then chop it up with a sword. Or the most extreme, he was to play the role of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. And he would lay on his side for over a year, eating food cooked over poop as a sign of the nasty food that people will have to eat during the siege of Jerusalem. And perhaps the most disheartening thing of all is the bad news God gave Ezekiel that no one was going to listen to him. Israel would reject him because of their rebellious and hard heart. And this recalls Moses' description of the people after the wilderness rebellions, when he predicted that exile would one day happen. And Ezekiel had the unfortunate privilege of seeing it all come to pass. And so, a dismayed Ezekiel, he begins to perform his task. And after about a year, he has another vision. This one is about the temple. He goes on this virtual tour of the temple, and he sees what's happening there in his absence, and it is not good. In the outer courtyard, in front of the temple, he sees this large idol statue. And then he sees the elders of Israel worshiping other gods, both outside and inside the temple. And then he sees the women of Israel. They're worshiping a Babylonian god named Tammuz, and the vision ends with God's glorious throne chariot moving up and away from the temple. It's leaving, going east, headed towards Babylon. And so in chapter 11, we come to see why and how God's glory appeared to Ezekiel there in Babylon. Israel's idolatry and their covenant violations, it's become so blatant and offensive that God has left his temple. They've driven him away and he consigns it to destruction. But God hasn't abandoned his people. Rather, he goes into exile with them. And so at the end of this vision in chapter 11, God promises that he will return a remnant of Israel back to the land and he'll transform them by removing their heart of stone and giving them a new soft heart of flesh so that they can love and truly follow their God after all. This is a small glimmer of hope and it's quickly submerged under the reality of the imminent destruction. But chapter 11, it's a key transition, and it helps us understand how the rest of the book has been designed. So the next three sections are all announcements of God's judgment, first on Israel, then on the nations around Israel, and then on Jerusalem itself. But then after that, the hopeful conclusion of chapter 11 gets developed in the final three sections of the book. First, hope for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all creation. 
Chapters 12 through 24 focus on God's judgment coming to Israel. And this is a diverse collection of poems and essays. And here Ezekiel shows his fondness for parable and allegory. So he depicts Israel as a burnt, useless stick or as a rebellious wife, or as a dangerous raging lion that gets captured, or as two promiscuous sisters. These are all depictions of Israel's senseless rebellion and idolatry that results in their ruin. In this section, Ezekiel also acts like a lawyer. He begins arguing the case that, first of all, Jerusalem's destruction is truly deserved after centuries of covenant violation. And that even if the most righteous people in the world, like Noah or Daniel or Job, were alive and praying for God to spare Israel, God would not accept their prayers. It's far too late. And so God's goodness actually demands that he bring justice on this generation of Israel. The exile has become inevitable. They've reached the point of no return. Following this, Ezekiel focuses first on the nations immediately around Israel, and then on the two most powerful states in the region, Egypt and then Tyre. Israel has allied with these nations and adopted their gods and their idols. And so God accuses the kings of Tyre and Egypt for arrogantly viewing themselves as gods who get to define right and wrong on their own terms. And God holds these kings accountable for their pride and he announces that he will use Babylon to bring them down. They will face God's justice along with everybody else. Following these really intense sections is a short story in chapter 33. Ezekiel's met by a refugee who's just arrived from Jerusalem and he gives them the report that Babylon has attacked the city of Jerusalem, that the city has fallen and the temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim warnings have become a reality. But remember, the end of chapter 11, that's not the end of the story. And so in the next video, we'll explore Ezekiel's profound vision of hope. But for now, that's the first half of the book of Ezekiel. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. In the first video, we were introduced to Ezekiel the priest, and he's sitting among the exiles in Babylon. And he's confronted by the awesome glory of God's temple presence, but it's appearing to him in Babylon. And then Ezekiel discovers why. It's because of Israel's idolatry and injustice that has compelled God to abandon his own temple. And while there is still hope for the future, the book went on to develop Ezekiel's message of divine judgment, first for Israel and then for the nations around Israel. And then a key moment happened in chapter 33. Ezekiel receives a report that the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem is over because the city has fallen The temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim words of warning came true. The exile was the most horrendous catastrophe that ever happened to Israel. And it raised the big questions of whether God was done with Israel for good. But remember, at the end of chapter 11, God promised that there was still a future beyond exile for Israel. And so the rest of the book is designed to explore Ezekiel's vision of hope. First for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all of creation. The hope for Israel begins with God promising to raise up a new David, a future messianic king who's going to be the kind of leader that Israel needed but never got. And this new Israel who's going to come under the messianic king's rule is going to be a transformed people. God's going to deal with the heart of their problem of rebellion by giving them new hearts. It's just like Moses promised at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. God says he's going to remove their hard hearts and send his spirit into his people to give them new soft hearts that can love and obey their God. And this idea gets developed in the next strange vision. Ezekiel sees a huge valley filled up with dry human bones and skeletons. And God tells him that it's an image, a metaphor for Israel's spiritual state. So their rebellion against God, it resulted in exile and the literal death of many people. But it was also a metaphorical death of their covenant relationship. And God tells Ezekiel that his spirit is coming to bring his people back to life. And so this wind comes and it causes all of the bones to stand up and it fills them with breath and life. And then skin grows over the bones and then all of a sudden Ezekiel sees all of these new humans standing in front of him. Now this vision, it's recalling the story about the creation of humans in Genesis chapter 2. Where God made humans out of dirt and divine breath. And so Israel and all humanity have rebelled, resulting in death. And so the only hope is that God would perform a new act of creation and remake humans in such a way that they can truly live in a relationship of love with God and with each other. 
And so after God is going to deal with the evil that's in the hearts of his own people, some questions still remain unresolved, like what about the evil that's still rampant out there among the nations? And what about the future of God's dwelling place in the temple? And this is what the final two sections of the book are about. So first come chapters 38 and 39, and they promise God's final defeat of evil among the nations, which gets personified by a ruler who's named Gog from the land of Magog. Now this name is derived from a genealogy of ancient kingdoms and lands from Genesis chapter 10, and it referred to powerful nations from the distant past. And so Ezekiel picks up this ancient biblical name as an image of any and all violent kingdoms. And so we find that Gog gets allied with seven nations that come from all four directions of the compass is clearly an image that represents all of the nations. And this also helps us understand why Ezekiel describes Gog with images that he used earlier in the book to describe the king of Tyre and the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. For Ezekiel, Gog is an amalgam of all of the worst, most violent people in the Bible. Gog is the archetype of human rebellion against God. The basic story in these chapters is that Gog resists God's plan to restore his people. And so just like Pharaoh in the Exodus story, Gog comes to destroy the people. But God unleashes his justice on Gog, and it's in a flurry of scenes that don't actually make very good literal sense if you read them in sequence. Because first, Gog and his armies are consumed by an earthquake, but then they're consumed by fire two different times. And then after that, God comes and strikes Gog and his army down in the fields where they lay unburied for months. It's clear that these scenes are full of symbol and imagery. Ezekiel has pulled out his entire poetic tool set here to describe how God is determined to finally defeat human evil that has ruined his world. And it's so that he can pave the way for a new creation. And so once evil is finally dealt with among the nations, the last section of the book describes how God's presence is going to one day return to his people and his temple to bring cosmic restoration. So Ezekiel first gets this long elaborate vision of a new temple and a new city. He's given this heavenly tour guide who shows him around the new temple complex and it's much larger and more majestic than even Solomon's temple. There's a new altar, new priests, a whole new system of worship. And then after this elaborate tour, God's glorious throne chariot that he saw back in his first vision comes back and it enters the new temple. Now the meaning of these temple visions has been the source of debate for a long, long time. So some Christian and Jewish readers believe that this vision will be fulfilled literally one day and that these chapters offer the actual blueprints of the new temple that will be built when the Messiah returns and brings God's kingdom. But many other Jewish and Christian readers think that this vision, like all of Ezekiel's other visions, is full of symbols. And they depict the reality of God's presence returning to his people in the messianic kingdom, but not necessarily in the form of an actual building. Whichever view you take, it's important that Ezekiel never calls the city Jerusalem. And chapters 47 and 48 show why. Ezekiel sees this tiny stream pouring out of the temple threshold and steps, and then it quickly becomes this raging river, and then it flows out of the temple and the city into the desert, into one of the most desolate places on planet Earth, the Dead Sea Valley. And then that river, it leaves behind it a trail of trees and life, and then the Dead Sea gets transformed into a living sea that's teeming with plants and animals. All of this imagery comes from the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And we see just how cosmic Ezekiel's vision really is. God's plan has always been to restore all humanity and all creation back to his life-giving presence. And so the book ends with the name of this garden city. The Lord is there. And so Ezekiel's visions come to a close, full of hope for a new future. New humans living in a new world that's animated by God's life-giving spirit. It's a world permeated with God's love and justice. And that's what the book of Ezekiel is all about. I am open to the as an inheritance, you are to present to the Lord a portion of the land as a sacred district, 25,000 cubits long and 20,000 cubits wide. The entire area will be holy. Of this, a section 500 cubits square is to be for the sanctuary, with 50 cubits around it for open land. In the sacred district, measure off a section 25,000 cubits long and 10,000 cubits wide. In it will be the sanctuary, the most holy place. 
It will be the sacred portion of the land for the priests who minister in the sanctuary and who draw near to minister before the Lord. It will be a place for their houses as well as a holy place for the sanctuary. An area 25,000 cubits long and 10,000 cubits wide will belong to the Levites who serve in the temple as their possession for towns to live in. You are to give the city as its property an area 5,000 cubits wide and 25,000 cubits long, adjoining the sacred portion. It will belong to the whole house of Israel. The prince will have the land bordering each side of the area formed by the sacred district and the property of the city. It will extend westward from the west side and eastward from the east side, running lengthwise from the western to the eastern border, parallel to one of the tribal portions. This land will be his possession in Israel and my princes will no longer oppress my people but will allow the house of Israel to possess the land according to their tribes. This is what the sovereign Lord says. You have gone far enough, princes of Israel. Give up your violence and oppression and do what is just and right. Stop dispossessing my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You are to use accurate scales and accurate ephah and an accurate bath. The ephah and the bath are to be the same size. The bath containing a tenth of a homer and the ephah a tenth of a homer. The homer is to be the standard measure for both. The shekel is to consist of 20 jiras. 20 shekels plus 25 shekels plus 15 shekels equals one mina. This is the special gift you are to offer. A sixth of an ephah from each homer of wheat and a sixth of an ephah from each homer of barley. The prescribed portion of olive oil measured by the bath is a tenth of a bath from each core, which consists of ten baths or one homer, for ten baths are equivalent to a homer. Also, one sheep is to be taken from every flock of two hundred from the well-watered pastures of Israel. These will be used for the grain offerings, burnt offerings, and fellowship offerings to make atonement for the people, declares the Sovereign Lord. All of the people of the land will be required to give this special offering to the prince in Israel. It will be the duty of the prince to provide the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings at the festivals, the new moons, and the Sabbath, at all the appointed festivals of the house of Israel. He will provide the sin offerings, grain offerings, burnt offerings, and fellowship offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. In the first month, on the first day, you are to take a young bull without defect and purify the sanctuary. The priest is to take some of the blood of the sin offering and put it on the doorpost of the temple, on the four corners of the upper ledge of the altar, and on the gatepost of the inner court. You are to do the same on the seventh day of the month for anyone who sins unintentionally or through ignorance. So you are to make atonement for the temple. In the first month, on the fourteenth day, you are to observe the Passover, a festival lasting seven days during which you shall eat bread made without yeast. On that day, the prince is to provide a bull as a sin offering for himself and for all the people of the land. Every day during the seven days of the festival, he is to provide seven bulls and seven rams without defect as a burnt offering to the Lord, and a male goat for a sin offering. He is to provide as a grain offering an ephah for each bull and an ephah for each ram, along with a hin of olive oil for each ephah. During the seven days of the festival, which begins in the seventh month on the fifteenth day, he is to make the same provision for sin offerings, burnt offerings, grain offerings, and oil. Of course, it's like the, the, the whole thing I, my, my take is, I appreciate God so detailed, you know. I mean, what do you expect? He's the, he's the creator of the universe where you know, and even our body, which the uh, system is not in random, but it has a it's a well um, organized system. There's a check and balance, you know, and so um, just hearing it for the first time, you know, in audible Bible that. I really, really, really appreciate his wisdom, his greatness, because, gosh, you know, he is so, so, so great. And it's 
spite of our nothingness, He still loves us. He loves us first. You know? Um, so anyway, the one that really uh, strikes me is this. The verse 9. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You have gone far enough, Prince of Israel. Give up your violence and oppression and do what is right, just and right. Stop the dispossessing my people, declares the Sovereign Lord. You are to use accurate scales, an accurate ifa, and an accurate bath. So, with this, in line with what I have been opening the Bible for the past few days, is, is the urgency of God for us to be transformed. You know, because uh, you could just imagine with all our... Uh, disobedience our our mis distrust in him though we say lord i trust you but but then you worry you panic you you know you get you you your temper is let loose and so your anger and and so and we also indulge with the negativity or negative aspect of the other people that you know um, so with all of this that's happening and you know you hear you hear from the news all the um, the desperation the the um, uh, people um, meeting uh, injury to themselves and to other people and you could just imagine how how um, angry or how hurt how displeased our lord is he must be very you know displeased because um You know he is uh, he's mad <laughs> you know and so we have to really stop you know and uh, as he says enough you know enough is enough and so we have to start with ourselves first that uh, you know we really have to trust him in spite of our issues like me I have several issues that's uh, you know uh, bothering me but uh, I trust God that he is with me in solving my problem you know and so and all these years um, he has uh, shown big and small miracles in our lives so he just have to stop displeasing our lord you know so it says enough O prince of israel and that's not just for the israel but it's that's for us the whole um people of God and all human beings you know because he wanted us all to go to heaven but he's a just God and and uh, of course um, there's a, a limit you know to to his uh, I mean even us you know when we're where our patience our our love has been uh, um, not uh, reciprocated, but instead it was it it's gone on the other side that we displease our Lord. So 
it's uh, we really have to think twice now because with all these things that is happening God is probably saying to us enough is enough And uh, let me see, there's one here that I... Uh, I like what's being said, you know, enough is enough. God is patient by nature, but even the Lord has limits. In today's reading, we see how God reprimands the princes of Israel, telling them that they have gone too far. Have we gone too far in testing our Lord and making him angry? So enough is enough. The Lord says he urges them to stop oppressing He urges them to stop oppressing the innocent and to start doing what is just and right. And this is across the board. Because I'm even, us sometimes who are already Christian, sometimes we become over-righteous, you know. We, we, we become over-righteous that we think, you know, we're always that we have the right to to criticize other people that we have to to the right to to put them down you know that uh, no it, it we have to to examine our intentions because the the most important thing is really is our thought process is our our action our words uh, pleases him because a lot of people are making him angry already you know so enough is enough the Lord says he urges them to stop oppressing the innocent and start doing what is just and right I wonder if this is not a time news word for all our politicians as we inch closer towards uh, election oh this was written in April of 2019 enough is enough God and the people are tired of the greed the selfishness of the princes of our nation and it's time to start acting with justice and righteousness So this is uh, written by Delmi Linscott of Living in Grace. So we really have to, uh, because it seems like I am, you know, the the Bible verses I am opening is. Uh, really transformation he's urging us to be transformed according to his uh, um, commandments his teachings you know that uh, we really have to start doing what is just and right try to examine ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit how we can improve ourselves in relation to our God because with this pandemic you don't know when is your time you know some people who are uh, well and just you know they just pass 
so I think it's really very um, so I'm also guarding myself you know trying to um, please the Lord and there's this uh, Ezekiel 45 to 47 um, Ezekiel's vision of the holy waters, which, if literally interpreted, would not be so much sweet as foul, draining away the dregs from old sacrifices and seem most likely to have that meaning find its landing place in the progress of the gospel. And the gifts of the Holy the Spirit that went out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and the ends of the earth. Ezekiel is given these words and vision to furnish the living rooms of our mind with tangible picture language of blessing and stability and flourishing. This is to both call us to faithful living. Note the clarion call to better behavior given to the prince. Enough Oh, prince put away violence and oppression execute justice and righteousness cease your eviction of my people declares the Lord God and also to encourage us with a future trajectory of a gospel progress that can excite us and motivate us The kingdom, this temple, this glory, this people, this future gospel, honor to God, all of which are here predicted, fulfilled in Christ Jesus, is the inheritance of God's people. We are called upon in our faithfulness of living and lifestyle to go up and go in, further up and further in, to enter into all that God has promised for us with diligence and zeal. So, let me see what else I... It says uh, in verse 1, When you allot the land as an inheritance, you are to present to the Lord a portion of the land as a sacred district with exact uh, measurements. And so, let us stop violence, negativity, um, anxiety, darkness, especially those darkness would, that would hurt other people or mislead them. Because uh, all these negative aspects bring stress because you're stressed with what you're doing going to do and you know that you're going to to hurt other people hurt yourself and put a lot of stress and as I said you know God wants us to be healthy and so let me put out this So, as I have been telling before, that, that negativity is not good for our health.
See, we have lots of uh, stressors in our lives, you know, and we just have to discern, be quick to discern, or ask the Holy Spirit to to give you an inkling if you're go going out of bounds that you're displeasing the Lord, you know, because uh, sometimes. Uh, we don't know, especially if you're just so so focused on on doing the bad thing, you know. So, what does uh, those negative, uh, you know, does to our body? It puts out this uh, stress hormones that initially it may be good because especially with the epinephrine this uh, fight or flight flight uh, hormone especially if you're in danger you know it gives you extra strength and uh, it shut down those that are not important so that uh, it uh, opens up those parts of the body that will help you Either you fight or you run away, you know. And so, but if these stress hormones uh, or stress hormones or chemicals in our body is sustained, you know, we don't know because they're, they're, they may be a uh, minute amount, but it affects the body. And it uh, dysregulate our immune system. You know, um, so it creates uh, diseases if we're not careful. So um, put away all those uh, stressors and ask the Holy Spirit to help you out. I've been always asking Him. Um, during the day when I wake up because I I cannot solve all my problems I need the uh, I need the uh, assistance backup you know or you know that I may you know rationalize some plan A plan B plan C you know but then you you pray that you be helped in guiding you which you know which is the one that really um, best to take and so so let's see what other things that uh, uh, stress um, gives us see it it accelerates the heart and lung action. It is uh, paling or flushing. So you get pale or flushed, or probably alternative uh, both. Uh, there are certain disease syndrome, the RSD, where you know we get this over sympathetic. Uh, um, reaction so we have this uh, uh, sympathetic is so uh, that is the fight or flight you know um, pathway and so we get the there's a flushed or failing you know and sometimes uh, uh, with this RSD you know we have uh, coldness in the affected area because it's uh, it's constricting the blood vessels and this is an overaction action reaction of the sympathetic and so it's a, it's it's it, it's um in a, a certain syndrome is uh, present is is known and it inhibits inhibition of stomach and upper intestinal action to the point where digestion slows down or stops. Especially 
when we're depressed you know we don't feel like eating or there's some people who are also overeating but a lot of times you know uh, when somebody is depressed they don't feel like eating they like said there's some that uh, overeats too and so of course there's a consequence of overeating also generally general effect on the sphincters of the body the sphincters are like the opening you know like our anus you know like it constricts it so we come <laughs> we get some constipation <laughs> so constricting of blood vessels in many parts of the body liberation of metabolic energy sources particular fat and glycogen for muscular action uh, dilatation of blood vessels for muscles so that it uh, gives uh, more supplies to the muscles so that if we fight or we run you know it's the muscle that's up now inhibition of the lacrimal gland that's responsible for tear production and saliva so we have dryness of the mouth you know dryness of the eyes uh, dilatation of the pupils well it's a part of the flight you know so uh, is the system that God has um, um, created where so that when we we fly we see more because our eyes our pupils are more dilated so it gives more increase the peripheral vision you know um, relaxation of the uh, of the bladder so um, we have retention and then inhibition of erection so it also with stress it you know it affects your sexual life you know um, auditory exclusion uh, loss of hearing tunnel vision oh, so there's also tunnel vision you know loss of peripheral vision so you can focus it's probably more on the optic nerve is the pupil is the the one you know where the colors of our eyes and then this inhibition of spine spinal reflexes and shaking you know we we, we have um, we think like chills but like especially when you're angry you have tremors you you shake you know so we have to make an effort really to to get rid of our stress one one way is to to bring it to the lord you know you unload it to him and let him help you uh, solve your problem and believe of course we have to be patient you know because sometimes the way he answers not the way we think is usually the best for us so let us uh, stop all those negativity and know God you know I remember um, you know I've been telling before you know that uh, I have a patient who cannot sleep because he was so worried about her daughter and um, just asking me for a tranquilizer um, I didn't uh, I told him I advised her to read the Bible at night and I said 
also he need to trust God that God loves his daughter more than he does she does that he knows what's best for her and her her part is to take care of herself and just keep on praying for her daughter and her family you know but for so uh, this is some of the things that I have um, this is so let's really do a true transformation let's uh, remove some of this uh, uh, stressors this darkness just cast it out cast out the devil that's influencing you with the precious blood of God of Jesus so there is ample reason to believe that faith in a higher power is associated with health in a positive way most studies uh, in Mayo Clinic uh, have shown that religious involvement and spirituality associated with better health outcomes including greater longevity, coping skills, health related quality of life, less anxiety, depression and suicide and enhanced recovery from illness in several studies have shown that in addressing the spiritual needs of the patient so let's get rid of all this uh, darkness first we have to cast out the devils the evil ones and have the Lord's fresh blood to cover you and your family and two, you have to believe and listen to his prompting. So, anyway, let me go back to um, I remember this uh, flowing of water. Um, We really have to just go with the flow of the Holy Spirit because uh, when we 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 go with the flow of the Holy Spirit, we will be blessed. Okay, now I think I'm gonna do my. Communion. Father, we believe in your Son, the Lord Jesus. We believe in your amazing love for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we recognize that we have a covenant with you. This new covenant was ratified by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. Right now, we acknowledge that Jesus bore our sins, our sicknesses, diseases, sorrows, griefs, fears, torments, unforgiveness, strife, and lack for us. Everything on that cross. Yes, Lord, we believe that Jesus' body was broken for us. His precious blood was shed on our behalf. We praise and thank you for Jesus. Glory to your name. By Jesus' stripes, we are healed in every cell, in every organ, in every function of our body. Thanks to Jesus, our youth is renewed. With long life, you will satisfy us, Father. Through Jesus' sacrifice, we have total and complete redemption. We are totally delivered from the devil in every single way. We are new creations in Christ. Our freedom has been bought and paid for. Yes, we are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are free. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks. The Lord Jesus, 
the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. We will eat now. Thank you, Father. After the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. We take the cup in our hand and hold it up to you right now. Father, this represents the blood of the new covenant in which all our sins, past, present, and future, are all remitted. They are all forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Praise your holy name. Through his blood, we and our family are redeemed from every curse, every ancestral curse, from every single curse of the law. Thank you. We will drink now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're a good, good God. You gave up your son to remove the barrier standing between you and us. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that above all else, you desire that we prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. We declare a new dimension of health, a new level of faith, a new realm of energy and divine strength. We declare that we are living, walking testimonies to all those around us who are defeated in this world. We have victory and new life in Jesus. Oh, that the world would come to know you. Protect, preserve, bless, and reach every single person in our family and our friends. In the wonderful and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus Christ, I bind all demonic forces. No. I take authority and I bind all powers and forces in the air, in the ground, the water, underground, netherworld, nature, in fire, and in men. You are the Lord over the entire universe, and I give you the glory for your creation. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus Christ, I bind all demonic forces, all forces of bad things, all negativity, all illness, sickness, infection COVID-19 and all its variants um, physical abnormality physical injury mountains obstacles financial and professional obstacles curse strife family division anxiety darkness confusion hatred unforgiveness and restlessness all negativity that have come against all human beings especially my family my relatives my friends acquaintances and even enemies and all those who are in prison physically mentally and spiritually and all those who pass before us and those who are suffering in purgatory. Cover us with your precious blood that was shed for us on the cross. Mary, our mother, we seek your protection and intercession. For the sacred heart of Jesus for us and our family, surround us with your mantle of love that guards the enemy. Saint Michael, our guardian angel, come defend us and our family against the evil ones that roam the earth. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus Christ, I bind and command all powers of evil to depart right now away from us, our homes, our land. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for faithful and compassionate God. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with your holy gifts. Let our weakness be penetrated with thy strength this very day, that we may fulfill all our duties consciously, that we may do what is right and just. Let our charity be such as to offend no one, hurt no one's feelings, so generous to pardon sincerely and wrong done to us. Assist us, O Holy Spirit, in all the trials of life. Enlighten us in our ignorance, advise us in our doubts, strengthen us in our weakness, help us in all the embarrassment, protect us in temptations, graciously hear us, O Holy Spirit, and pour thy light into our hearts, our soul, our mind. Assist us to live a holy life, to grow in goodness and grace. Amen.
Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings, for all the enlightenment that you've given us. Help us to be strong, to fight temptations, dear God. And give us the light, the direction. Yes, Lord. Especially those people who are in darkness. That they may come to light. And free us from the shackles of sin and temptations. Help us, Lord, to discern and help us to be stronger in resisting temptations, in following the light, not ourselves, but the light that you've provided for us. In Jesus' name, Amen. May Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you and God bless us all.